study how sounds are produced and the principal auditory differences of sound. To begin with, what is involved in producing sound? To help answer this question, we experiment first with a tuning fork. When the fork is struck, its prongs begin to vibrate. These vibrations set up invisible waves in the surrounding air. We can picture these waves as animated drawings. Striking the prongs distorts them. Like other solid objects, these prongs resist distortion. They spring back and forth, thus producing new distortions. Each movement or vibration sets up new disturbances, or sound wave impulses. These continue as long as the prongs are in motion. The speed with which sound waves move depends upon the medium through which they pass. We will assume that these waves are being transmitted by air molecules. Every time the prongs move apart, they push against the adjacent air. In turn, this movement affects the air further on. In this segment of the wave, we can see that some molecules are pushed relatively close together. These represent condensations of air. Each time the prongs spring inward, a partial vacuum forms in their vicinity. Air molecules nearby move into this vacuum, leaving a rarefied zone behind. Thus, there are alternate zones of condensation and rarefaction of the air. The number of times a given molecule moves back and forth in one second is the frequency of the wave. In one complete vibration, indicated here by the bracket, sound travels a distance of one wavelength. The velocity of any sound wave equals its wavelength times its frequency. We can record pressure variations in sound waves with this kind of instrument, an oscillograph. Sound waves are striking the diaphragm at the left. The stylus records the sound waves as a graph. Later, we shall use such graphs to represent sound waves. Condensations cause the stylus to move upward. Rarefactions cause it to move downward. So far, we've seen how sound waves are produced. Next, we'll identify three auditory effects of musical sounds, loudness, pitch, and quality. We begin with loudness. Every sound sets up a disturbance in the transmitting medium. The larger the disturbance or displacement of the individual particles, the greater is the height of its graph above the neutral line. This displacement above the neutral line is called amplitude, and it is amplitude that determines loudness. As the amp its loudness increases. Next, let us consider pitch, the auditory effect of frequency. First, we hear the sound of middle C. Next, we hear G below middle C. And now the sound of C below middle C. What causes such differences in pitch? To explain such differences, we picture two different sound waves. Here, the lower fork makes more complete vibrations per second. Therefore, its frequency is greater. It is evident that the one with the greater frequency has the higher pitch. The frequency of a vibrating string depends upon the material it's made of and its density, tension, and length. Different instruments produce sounds of different tonal quality, even when playing the same basic frequencies. Each vibrating string may be made to produce different tones. 
To explain some of the reasons for this, let us observe this string. Here there is no motion at these endpoints or nodes. The string vibrates along its full length and produces its longest possible wavelength. This is the lowest or fundamental frequency of the string, sometimes called the first partial. If the string vibrates in two segments, it produces a wavelength that's one half that of the fundamental. This is the first overtone, which may be called the second partial. Since wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency, the frequency of the first overtone is twice that of the fundamental. When the string vibrates in three segments, it produces its second overtone, the third partial. Here, the frequency is three times that of the fundamental. But usually, several different modes of vibration occur simultaneously. The result is a compound waveform. Here, we represent the fundamental tone supplemented by its first and second overtones. Differences in the audible components of a sound determine its quality. Quality helps us recognize the characteristic sounds of various musical instruments and distinguish one voice from another. With this oscilloscope, we can represent as waves the sounds being produced and see their different modes of vibration as in the case of vibrating strings. Besides strings, we've already considered vibrating surfaces. The vibrations from such diaphragms are often quite complex. This diaphragm, for example, vibrates in a number of different segments. The third of the principal sources of sound is the vibrating column of air. The organ pipe, like the woodwind, produces sound by means of such an air column. Often the exposed pipes of an organ are merely decorative, and sounds are produced by the pipes in the organ loft. The wavelengths fitting the shorter pipes are shorter, and their frequencies are greater than the longer pipes. Consequently, the shorter pipes produce the sounds of higher pitch. The different kinds of pipes produce different qualities of sound. The organist uses stops and keys and pedals to admit compressed air into the pipes. Besides woodwind instruments and organ pipes, another mechanism that depends upon a vibrating column of air for its sound is the vocal mechanism of man. Here, sound waves result from vibrations of air that start in the vocal folds of the trachea. These waves are reflected back and forth in the cavities of the mouth, nose, and head, thus producing the complex sounds of speech and song. So we've sampled a few out of the multitude of sounds in our environment and have studied the meanings of loudness, pitch, and quality. From the vast number of vibrations that we interpret as sounds, we may gather a wealth of meaning and enjoyment.
Hey, Mute, what's the big idea of busting up my act? Why, Mutie, I'm a new man. Haven't you heard about the wonderful thing Dr. Weston did for me? He pepped up my pulse, gave me a set of vocal cords. You ought to see him. Take it from me, you'll never land a job the way you are. Let's go. Here we are. Hello, Talky. What's on your mind now? Doc, my old friend Mutie wants you to put him through the works. Absolutely. Scientific art of beauty. The latest from Loveliness Laboratories. Research to the rescue, helping Mary emphasize all the nice things in her very nice face, showing her how to minimize certain features, how to accent others. Lady Science has done all right by you. You sure look swell. Uh-oh, now she's gone and ruined everything. But Beauty Science could have helped her here, too. Let's go to Beauty Headquarters. Yes, Hollywood. And meet famous Paramount makeup man, Eddie Sands, who thinks that glasses like hairdos can flatter the features that just like eyebrow and lip lines, the lines of one's glasses can bring out good points, make bad points inconspicuous. When an actress's role calls for specs, it's just part of the normal makeup problem to Eddie, and the way he's solved this problem can be of tremendous value to the 10 million American women outside of Hollywood who have to wear glasses, not to play in pictures, but because of eyesight. Eddie's drawings give you the lowdown based on two fundamental types of faces, the round face and the long face. First, the hair. High and close for the round face, but low and wide for the long face. Lipstick next. Applied as much up and down as possible on the round face, but the long face needs horizontal lines like this. Now for the eyeglasses. For the round face, an arched bridge and a dropped lower curve to help correct that circular appearance. The long face needs just the opposite, an almost flattened upper edge and lenses with wide, shallow curves. Now, if you don't believe that these added lines are effective, watch closely while we switch hairdos, lip shape, and eyeglasses from one face to another. As you see them now, they're okay, but wait. There, the shape of the face is the same, but how differently it looks with wrong makeup and glasses. Let's put everything back. There, much better. In fact, perfect. Now let's visit a factory where they make optical glass and see just how modern manufacturing technique makes possible lenses that not only aid eyesight, but appearance. Here's the beginning of a long, intricate procedure, carefully mixing the various ingredients from which fine, modern optical glass is produced. Ingredients like silica, barium, lead, lime are rotated in drums like these until the proper proportions are thoroughly blended. Furnaces in an optical glass factory have to be just the right heat, and they have to be kept at just the right heat as the various basic ingredients become molten. That's why temperature readings are taken frequently with delicate pyrometers. And after 24 hours of cooking and stirring, a miracle occurs. The contents of the special clay pots are now liquid glass, white hot, 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. And now comes one of the most fascinating operations in the making of optical glass, pouring. Right before your eyes, as the roller passes over it, liquid becomes solid. A hot molten mass on one side becomes a hot solid sheet on the other. A sheet of exactly the right thickness for additional processing. See a change color going from white hot to red hot. And that's the signal for it to be pushed into the annealing ovens, where it will be cooled gradually to room temperature at which it can be safely handled.
Much later now and much cooler now. Also a few cracks, but they don't hurt. Yes, the sheet of glass is ready for cutting into squares, but not every square is used. As the cutter cuts, he's also looking for defects. He assorts and discards, as does everyone who works with the glass from now on. Actually, only about 25% of the original pouring finds its way into finished spectacles. Now reheated and softened, the squares are shaped into approximate lens forms. First, roughly in an oven, then more exactly shaped in a molding press. They're not squares any longer and they're not called squares now, they're called blanks. A typical inspection, and there are as many as 45 different inspections throughout manufacturing. Then getting ready for grinding. This black liquid is pitch. It's poured into a heavy form and when the surplus is removed, a coating of it remains. Into this, the preheated blanks are carefully placed. The pitch holds them firmly in position, whether on the bowl or on this drum, each symbolic of the countless forms used in the delicate grinding process. Hundreds of ingenious machines grinding millions of highly complicated basic lens prescriptions. A series of operations requiring the utmost accuracy and precision. machines and polishing now until the blanks become as clear as the finest crystal. A bath and a special cleansing solution and when they emerge from the suds their official name has changed from blanks to lenses. Yes, they're almost ready for frames. But not quite. Centers of vision have to be carefully marked on each lens and the proper axis must be determined. And more in the endless round of inspections. Experts checking on correct curvature, optical centers, and at the same time looking carefully for imperfections. Then the manufacturing process is over. The lens is ready for your specialist and his final grinding to your own prescription and face requirements. Basic shaping of the lens is done by various cutting devices. The edging is done on an abrasive wheel. Yes, the fundamental round lens can be fashioned into any one of 300 shapes to help the appearance as well as eyesight. Which brings us back to Mary Jones. Still don't like your old specs, Mary? Neither do we. Take them off. They're not right for your face. But these are a set of three, for just as a woman varies her wardrobe for different occasions, so can she find exciting variations in her glasses. These for formal wear. These for sports, same lens but tinted. And these for informal day wear, fitting right into the pretty picture that's Mary's face. Yes, science has entered every field of beauty today. No matter what the problem or what type of face we have, advice is available to us. So that in a highly competitive world where appearance counts for so much, each of us can always look his best. Well, here we are back in a cave on the banks of the Dordogne River in France, thousands of years ago. And there's uh, plenty of hair, as you can see, on the gentleman, but uh, no hat and no hairdo to speak of. That hair is really interfering with his business. Nearby, the cave woman, his wife, is grilling a fish over an open fire. Now, the caveman is very plainly bothered by that uh, hair that is growing so plentifully on his head, in all directions. Suddenly he looks over toward the fireplace and he sees the surviving backbone of a fish that has been eaten. And it gives him an idea. Now 
I don't say that we have proof that this happened, but it could have happened, and some such original discovery must have been made. Now see what he does with the backbone of that fish. Puts up his hair as best he can and uses the backbone, or part of it, as a side comb to hold it in place. Let's imagine, at least, that that was the first hairdo. Now we slip forward a few thousand years to the time of the Babonians in the Near East. See what kind of hairdos they had? Well, they not only curled their hair, but they curled their beards, too. It was a religious rite with them. Now we go over to the land of the Egyptians, about 2,500 years B.C., and notice a change. They shaved their heads completely, and they shaved their beards, too. But they wore an artificial beard made out of wood or horn or some such material. And the women, too, shaved their heads and wore wigs. Now, of course, we're talking about the, the aristocracy, the, the uh, noble people and the rulers of those days, not the poor people. And here is an Egyptian woman with the kind of imitation hair or wig that was worn by the high-born ladies of those days. Another thing about the uh, Egyptian women of those days was that the higher the headdress they wore, the more noble their blood was supposed to be. So you can see there was quite some competition among the ladies in a vertical way. Really getting high in some of these. Another peculiar thing was that when the princesses or queens uh, acted in an official way, they too wore an imitation beard on their chin. Now we're coming forward to the Grecian days. And of course, we know all about these from drawings and paintings of the old days and written descriptions. And many of these pieces, by the way, are actual survivals of those periods and have been preserved in antique shops and in museums. This is the Greek style of hairdo. at all ages a scarf was often used as a covering for the hair with or without a hat on top of that now we're coming forward to the roman days there is a roman painting and <laughs> peculiar place for it it's on the bald sconce of a roman and here we have one of the uh, roman ladies of the uh, court of augustus caesar and this is the kind of wig